different, right? Like the like how far is this unvaccinated men propagating? Um, uh, not much, I think. Uh, so right now I can see the the ion node itself being propagated around. Uh, I'm still figuring out how to let the, for example, let the ion node just generate unvaccinated in and let the Ambexim in public uh, around in the system. Um, yeah, and another thing is that even if we have the Ambexim in, uh, we still don't know what to do with like a lot of the, the, the size reasoning uh, around the Ambexim in because I think, for example, if the, if the downstream does something that's size related, it's going to uh, read the size hint of the Ambexim in or uh, trying to like get the value out of it, which is like, if, uh, which is like uh, pretty difficult right now, and like uh, because we don't have the right value, it, uh, it it seems like problematic. Yeah. Uh, Horace, to give a different uh, answer to your question, um, so we've done a few initial exploratory investigations of unbacked cements before. So uh, yeah. one, um, so the one easy case which we actually did most of the enablement we needed is do a non-zero call and then do some point-wise ops on it and then re do a reduction to get rid of the dynamic shapes. So this re this mostly ran into the size hints problem where things are trying to assume that they had access to the actual sizes. And I think we got all that to work actually. Um, but, but so like for, for sizes, you just put in a fake size. Yeah, so the in general, ideally the user tells us what they expect the size to be for the heuristic stuff. And otherwise, yeah. we will just need to hard code something. So we'll need to put this logic in somewhere. I don't know if it should be in shape env or in um, in inductors size bars concept. But uh... also, yeah, I agree. And another problem I found is that um, if I put like a hard coded size hint, like let's say thirty two, uh, in some cases it will work, but in some cases, the generated kernel is actually not operating in the uh, the data region that's uh, that's correct. Like um, like like the the generic charting kernel might be have the wrong strikes or like the 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 the, the long the wrong sizes. That's uh, when 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 we pass into a uh, tens of different size, then it would actually not uh, right like generate the right kernel. Sorry, like not generate the right right content for the tensor. Uh, so. I, like, I think it shouldn't happen if it's as long as through a size hint. Like it, it may happen if like inductor guards on it being a certain value, uh, and then specializes, uh, specializes it. But if it's kept symbolic, then I, I think that shouldn't happen. So like we can't just like put the like underlying value directly in it. We we need some like special handling that says like this is only okay to use in size hints, uh, but, but not anywhere else. To give another example of a uh, valid size hint is when we run partitioning in AOT Autograd, um, that's going to look at the sizes and uh, you know, you're not going to be able to, you, you don't know. So you need, you need to guess um, when you're trying to decide what partition is best for memory usage. Um, okay, but I actually wanna, I wanna give another example of stuff that breaks. So, uh, so here's a pattern that shows up in um, the recommendation style models, which is uh, um, you are you want to do a bunch of embedding table lookups, but um, the embedding tables are all on random different machines. And so, what you need to do is you need to send your data to the machine that actually has the embedding table for the features you have. And in general, the amount of data you send to each machine is variable because, well, you know, you have some features of one thing and not features of others. So the what this looks like is first you do an all to all collective to tell the destination what size to expect because you've like computed locally like how many uh, entries you have in each partition. You send those sizes over and then you do the actual collective to um, send in the data on the tensor you've allocated based on those sizes and then you do your embedding table lookups um, with the uh, 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 tensors in question. So, uh, so what's going on here is that once you've received the size of the splits from the all to all collective, that is gonna be a tensor, which you're gonna like call dot item on and then construct tensors from. And like all, all of this needs to work as well inside inductor. 
But and then these like uh, these unbacked cements are used uh, for a while. Uh, they are used until you pull the embedding table book up. Is that like a while, or is that like I mean, too often? Uh, <laughs> I mean, you're not doing that much in this forest arc because you're just doing an embedding lookup and then pulling it. So in, in that sense, there's not much. But but you are like feeding these into like you know these like fused uh, you know FBGM operators if you're if you're operating on like the torch rake sharding level. So um, I uh, let me think. So in torch rake DLRM. Actually, let me share my screen for a moment. So in Torchrek DLRM, uh, the um, the 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 big uh, the big the like thing that I found most annoying when I was trying to trace through this code with just Dynamo. So this isn't even talking about inductor. This is just can I capture it in Dynamo, is that um, uh, essentially uh, after all this communication has happened, you have a bunch of batch sizes uh, for um, each rank. And Torchrek sort of like wants to know if the batch sizes are all the same, because they are all the same, then it can do a like 2D kernel. Otherwise it has to do a 1D kernel that can deal with variable batch sizes. So like it iterates through each of the batch sizes, checking if they're equal or not. But these are all unbacked cements because I got the batch sizes from a all to all com. So like none of this works at all. I, I'm still trying to figure out how exactly I should modify Dynamo or uh, Torturec to deal with this. Yeah, I'm not sure. This stuff feels like extremely painful to me. Uh, yeah, I'm, not sure. I'm not sure what the strategy is either. Actually, a question. Oh, Brian, go, you go first. Uh, just like very general question, but in my head, that is that's like a do different things based on data dependent control flow. And then for a while, our policy has been graph break when that happens. And do you think like the nice long term thing that we want is not to graph break, but just have like a separate kernel? for the like the pre and post data dependent thing is that like the thing that we want and we just need to figure out how to do it or is that not necessarily what we want or i don't know uh so a different kernel might be the right thing um like there was an intuition from dennis that um for this particular case in principle the one the 1d variable batches kernel should work even if the batches are all the same so you just need to make sure you go that path and I did that sort of, uh, uh, I don't know if I did it right, but I certainly got past that point when I was uh, tracing through uh, sharded torch work. So, I mean, maybe, yeah. So th that's certainly one way to do it. The other way to do it is torch con, but I don't really want to do core torch. I think torch con is the wrong tool for the job here. Well? I was kind of wondering, um, instead of like trying to customize the majority of what Torchrek does as custom kernels or as special inductor behavior? What if we just, could we get a lot out of just customizing the first all to all that exchanges sizes? If we have a, a special kernel that knows, uh, that knows that it's exchanging sizes and like maybe knows that to mark them especially as size hints or to allow special things to happen with them, can we just let the, the rest flow through regular inductor? Um. Okay, so this is a great question, but I, I don't know the answer to this. And so I want to just sort of step through like morally what we expect inductor to do in this case. So let's just talk about this all to all case, right? So if I do an all to all to get the splits and then I use item, which is what Torchwork does to get out an integer so that I can pass it somewhere. It seems to me that in the inductor cogen, at some point I should like say something like I zero equals, uh, you know, splits result dot item. And then that I zero can just get used for the rest of the like regular shape computation that happens in inductor. Agree, disagree? Or like, Go ahead, this Mark. doesn't seem that controversial. Uh, I, I like, this seems like the, the only way to do it. Okay, so now I'm uh, batting it over to you, Will. So why is there this dynamic scalar thing? 
Like, do you even need an iron node for this? Uh, I think we need an iron node to be able to actually co-gen the dot item call in the in the generated code. Uh, I mean, but but um, what other ways to I guess like cause right now, uh, local scalar dance lowers to the dynamic scalar IR. Um, that I mean, that's probably why it's there right now. Um, but what other ways will we will we do it? So let's let's talk about another example. So uh, someone added, uh, oh, you did. So when you implemented all to all, um, there's a there's actually a, a different dynamic shape that shows up there, um, which is you don't know how much data you're getting, and so you have an IR node for the all to all collective, and uh, you you are returning a tensor, but one of the sizes on the tensor is uh, an unbacked simmon. And well, if I remember correctly, what you did was you just modified the code gen for this uh, node to do an extra assignment to make sure I zero got into scope so you could use it for other things. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So the only difference between item and your all to all collective is that item doesn't actually return a tensor. It returns a like, Scalar thing. So there, there's just there's just some like mismatch going on here, which I'm not sure. Uh, so this uh, this really uh, leads to another related thing, which I've been telling people about, which is that um, like if the item had been a float, and then we did a bunch of like operators on it, we actually need some way to turn those operations back into tensor operations, so that inductor knows how to compile them, because in general. Uh, we don't expect inductor to know how to compile arbitrary Python uh, math functions on uh, on sim floats. This is not this is like not the point of the cement mechanism. The point of the cement mechanism is just for shape reasons. So I also I also thought about actually having the scalar be a one element tensor and have it flow around in the system. Uh, but then we would need to call dot item at every usage point, so which it's or probably like, not a, I, not a I good think idea. The, the dot item thing, like, uh, like the, like I, I would say that like unbacked simmons should just be associated with the operator that produces them, uh, and, and then basically when we cogen them, you just uh, add like the dot item or you add like the the initialization of like the shape uh, at that point. Uh, would would be what what I would say for the cogen. Will, does this make sense to you or not really? Yeah, I think it's okay. Uh, I, I think it makes sense to me. Uh, the only thing is that right now, uh, I am still like kind of stuck on the on the Triton code gen part as well. Like, uh, I haven't got that to work correctly. So maybe that's something I need to uh, move with Horace into as well. Okay. Um... I'm going to, one more chaser on this topic, and Brian, um, I'm glad you're here, is that um, with AOT Autograd, there's also another problem with unbacked simmons, which is that um, in the view manipulation code, uh, you sometimes do equality comparisons between sizes to sort of figure out if things have changed or not. And uh, well, we can't do that if there's unbacked simmons. Because those equality comparisons won't know to report true or false. Oh, but, but this is like a, another side note on like our um, our like shape and infra. I, I think we do, we do need the concept of like uh, true only if it's guaranteed to be true. Uh, if that makes sense. Like uh, so, like for example, in, in a doctor compilation, we we can do like a is this equal like. Uh, like, is this guaranteed to be equal versus, um, like, is this equal for this case and we're willing to guard? Uh, and and so I, I think we need this kind of concept. Uh, we, we need to be able to access this kind of concept el elsewhere in, uh, outside of Inductor as well. Yeah, I think I've seen that. Um, so the, when I was like propagating the unbacked cement around in the system, um, um, like, I don't know what to do with the gauss code. like. Some gods are asking whether I four equals to zero or not equal to zero. 
or not equal to one or something like that. Um, I don't know what to like do with that actually. Like, yeah. Okay. Do we have any more comments here? Okay. Horace, putting you on the spot. Tell us some more about LLMs. Um, Okay. Uh, well, if you're not ready, I'll 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 pick another. Well, I, 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 I'm just wondering whether, whether I should pull up my slides. Uh, let me we, see. We are being live streamed. Um, okay. The so the the uh, so the, the main thing is I guess about LLM. So it's kind of um we've been working on like basically how, how fast can you make a PyTorch transformer inference uh without um and kind of like na native PyTorch. And so, like, I, I think the first thing you very quickly notice for like, uh, like a, a lot of the repos out there is that they're extremely uh, CPU overhead bound. And so, you know, just by kind of applying like torch compiling cuda graphs, we're, we're able to kind of speed this up uh, a lot. Uh, and then, kind of the next kind of parts that we've been thinking about, um, like, or like a, a, after you've kind of gone in the basics. So this is basically just about like how good is your FP sixteen. Uh, like, you know, transformer inference performance. And so we're able to get up pr like pretty close uh, to the maximum possible uh, performance. Uh, so the next thing you have to do here are like things that are not um, like no, no longer just like, you know, regular compilation. You need to look at things like quantization and stuff like that. And, and so here we've been uh, uh, like, you know, uh, exploring like various kinds of quantization techniques as well as kind of how to accelerate them. Uh, and so, uh, intake quantization ends up working um, pretty well in, in this case, and it kind of works uh, just only with inductor. You, you don't need uh, any other special kernels. Um, in four is a little bit more complicated, um, and is not something we can really support uh, super well uh, in uh, in it, like any, any part of our stack, really. <laughs> and, and so one of the things that uh, I think we uh, kind of thought about, we want to add is we want to add kind of like dequant primitives uh, to uh, to uh, PyTorch. And what these dequant primitives are, are basically like ways, of, like it's like loading uh, like int four values or int three values that are packed into some larger uh, tensor. Uh, and the idea is that like we could then, you know, pattern match on these like dequant uh, primitives uh, in order to kind of generate more efficient code specifically for those primitives. Um, and, and so I, I, the reason I think I like this approach a bit more than kind of introducing new D types uh, for these like sub byte uh, types is that the space of possible uh, like uh, quantization representations is like very vast. There's like in four, there's in three, and then there's like a lot of other things. Like for example, like how many scaling factors uh, do you have for your tensor? Like, do you have a scaling factor per one to 28 elements? Do you have a scaling factor per row? And these things are not so easy to represent in regular PyTorch code. And so I, I think they kind of warrant uh, special primitives uh, in order to code down them. Uh, Vasily? Oh, just wondering, are you talking about just unpacking the bytes or also unpacking the bytes and scaling? Because uh, you said dequan, which has like a, an existing meeting for quantization. Uh, I think this kind of needs to be designed slash thought thought through a li little bit more. It's it's possible that we need to do, at the very least, like uh, unpacking the bytes is like a pretty awkward operation that we can't really represent now in regular PyTorch. Uh, but yeah. I think the scaling operation itself is also a pretty awkward representation, uh, be because like what you have is like you have like you know say like you know uh, thirty two elements and then you have like a scale factor, you have like eight, or like you have like, you know, one scale factor for four elements. And so you need to do like a multiply between the four, like each of the four elements in your uh, like scaling uh, with like, and each one corresponds to like, you know, eight values uh, in your like 32 element uh, tensor. And, and this is an operation that's not so easily represented in, in PyTorch. And so I, I think we also need some kind of primitive for that. Uh, whether they're like the same op or not, uh, I haven't really thought through yet. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so, is the, uh, the you're trying to go to a representation uh, that can be code gen, and as part of that, you want to pack the data as well. Is that the problem you're trying to solve? Um, uh, if it's not clear, uh, okay. Uh, 
uh, what about so so custom ops i'm assuming it's not an option because now it's not easy to figure out how to lower to code jam is that or i mean there's no or like uh there's no real difference between a custom op and an op that we uh, put into pytorch <laughs> well i mean there, there's a packing part of it right so uh, if you if you pack something as a, just a regular tensor Oh, no, so, now so to... we, we would pack it into like an N32 tensor or something like that. Right. So if you pack it as N32 tensor, now you have to worry about the fact that whether this N32 tensor interacts with other ops, how? Because other ops cannot actually interact with it. Only this specific uh, op can interact with it. They don't. Uh, it, it's like the, the short answer. And, and so part of the reason why I, I don't think these really warrant another D type is there's really like one operation, maybe two, maybe three that ever are going to interact with these like sub byte types. And those are matrix multiplications, attention, maybe convolution. <laughs> uh, but I, I haven't seen the convolution case yet. Uh, and, and so in this case, like, uh, you know, basically these types disappear uh, after like the first operation you do with them, you do with them. And so it's not really worth, I think, propagating these types that I'll, I'll throw through your- Right. Own. Okay. so. Okay, so what, what you are proposing is, uh, yeah, can you summarize what you're proposing? I'm trying to see where, whether the existing representation is sufficient or not. Uh, so I'm trying to understand that. Uh, I mean, the existing representations are fine. We just need to add like new ops. So like, uh, for example, okay. It, it, okay. it would be like a, uh, I mean, the, the very minimum thing you can add is you could uh, imagine adding like a, a load four bits Op <laughs> that, that yeah, takes yeah, like a uh, yeah. you know uh, value packs into n thirty two tensor and returns you a new uh, flow thirty two tensor. Okay, and, and from the perspective of quantization, this is really if you if you decouple the quantization in two parts, one that is actually does the quantization in whichever way it wants to do to specific bit width, and then second question is around how to lower such a model uh, with custom ops and whatever not like what do you have. So you're talking about the second part, right? Or no, I'm, I'm talking about the first part. Uh, like, uh... Uh, I see. So, so I, I would, Im I would have imagined that in the first part, even if you did not pack the data, you could represent the idea whether it's a four bit or three bit or whatever other things are with a uh, whatever condition workflow allows you today. But from that, if you want to go to something where you actually get the pack data, it could be treated as a separate step too, right? So your your expression in terms of what the condition can give you is no, no, separate no, from. We're starting with we're starting with like. Uh, I'm talking about like we, we have like the path data already. Uh, mm, and that's generated from the quantization work or some form of quantization oh, work. I, I think I understand the confusion here. Uh, so like I, I, I am only talking about the run path component of this. Uh, I'm not I, talking about yeah, okay, got like it. Uh, the yeah. initial conversion of, of yeah, the yeah, yeah. Weights, okay, uh, okay. to uh, int a weights. Uh, that's kind of like a separate discussion uh, that we also had about like the, the right workflow uh, here. Okay. Um, okay, so that makes sense. So that that falls into the second part, like with the two parts. It seems like a runtime comment, just second part of it. So, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, Chris. Okay. Uh, oh, oh. Just, yeah. I was gonna say, like, is it not representable today in PyTorch, or it's not convenient to generate code from the representation you have to use? Or no, I'm. Everything is representable. <laughs> you know, in worst case, you you iterate over each element individually, and, and you you know bit shift each one uh, like yourself. Uh, it is not representing like conveniently. Like I, I think, for example, Charles added a pattern that pattern maps against like some kind of int four uh, loads. Uh, but the pattern I think is like quite complicated, and I'm not sure if like this kind of pattern really scales to uh, um, this kind of pattern really scales to. Uh, like, you know, other kind of quantization formats that we might want to add. Okay, that's it for time. Oh. Thanks everyone. If you want to hear about zero conjugate bit, uh, come to the Funk Torch meeting right after this.